now. All right. Um, so again, my name is Anna Valerie. I am the outgoing Bird Friendly Communities Program Manager. I am training our new Program Manager, Kathy, who is, I think, on the call. Um, so she'll be doing these presentations from here on out, but they are near and dear to my heart. Hello, Kathy. Um, so I hope you all enjoy and feel free to put questions in the chat uh, while you think of them or hold them until after both Chris and I talk and we can dive in together. All right. So first off, Houston Audubon, great organization. I'm not a bias or anything, but um, we have seven, over 17 sanctuaries in the greater Houston Galveston region. And so this is a map of some of them. Um, the most of them are open to the public and they're great places to go look for birds and, and really connect with nature. Um, and so I like to start all of my presentations, whatever I'm talking about birds in Houston, I really like to drive this home. Our region, is so, so, so incredibly important for birds. Um, Houston uh, is right on the kind of this, this area where we get all, almost all of the central flyway migratory birds, but we also get some of the Mississippi flyway migratory birds. And the state of Texas alone has had over 600 species of birds recorded. Houston, the Houston area has had over 400 birds recorded, species of birds recorded, which is incredible. And two and a half million and now, now people with current updated radar technology, they think that's actually 2 billion, up to 2 billion birds uh, fly through Texas every single year um, on their journeys north and south for migration. So um, why? Why are we so important? Um, this is from Cornell, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Living Bird Magazine, but um, our area is what is known as a fire escape for birds. And so you can see it is lit up and that is indicating that this is a, an important spot for birds. And so what does a fire escape mean? And uh, we're gonna talk about one of my favorite species. I am a big fan of shorebirds and seabirds and all of my coastal species. And this is a buff-breasted sandpiper, which is one of our a grassland uh, appreciating shorebirds. And this female buff-breasted sandpiper um, was tagged a little backpack and this was her journey north and south each year, um, or this was one particular year. So you can see that this little bird, they're not, they're not huge birds, not like this, um, goes all the way from northern Canada down to the southern tip of Brazil every year. And you can also see on this, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, uh, this bird on her way south crosses over that little isthmus, but on her way north, this bird goes straight from the northern part of South America right over to, um, to our region. And so if the birds are doing this route, it's a 600 mile journey that they have to get through without stopping with, and, and just hope that weather is good and that things are in their favor. But if they choose to go the other route, it is 1800 miles nonstop for that little bird. And unfortunately, when they arrive, they are arriving to a place that has changed very drastically over the past couple of decades. And so keep your eyes, feel, I know most of the folks on this car are from Houston, but look at your, your particular location on the map as I click through um, each decade. And you can see red is housing density and Houston, our little Gulf Coast region is just blowing up. And so what does that mean for our birds? So what used to be native prairie, uh, the Houston Gulf Coast region used to be primarily native pra or prairie grassland areas with riparian corridors. Unfortunately, this habitat, it's beautiful, it's amazing, it's important. It's also very easy to build on. And so what happens is we end up mowing and then putting in our subdivisions and we continue to expand outwards as more people move into the area and Houston has projected growth for the next 50 years, we're gonna see more and more of that prairie kind of disappear. And what do we put in the prairie's place? Big cities big housing developments, and all of this means issues for our um, birds that used to and still need to rely on our area when they're migrating through or our resident birds. And so the Bird Friendly Communities Program is aimed to help support birds even within these urban environments. So it's, there's no reason why we can't develop our cities and our, and our housing developments in our own spaces to be more welcoming to birds. And so I'm gonna walk you through the four steps to Bird Friendly Communities. And I just want to say ahead of time, bird filling communities can be implemented at any scale. If you are in an apartment with a tiny porch, you can be part of bird friendly communities. If you're representing an HOA or a school, uh, 
office campus, you can also be a part of bird friendly communities. Um, and so the foundation for BFC is this idea of creating habitat, so planting native plants. All right, everybody go in the chat. Let me know what you think this answer is. So how many caterpillars will a chickadee feed its young until the entire clutch fledges the nest? And so a chickadee clutch can be anywhere from like four to six little, little chickadees. So how many caterpillars does that mother bird need to feed her babies until the whole nest is off on its own? I see the chats lighting up. Hopefully we're getting some answers in there. I'll give you another 10 seconds or so. All right, I'm sure you guys are all getting this right. It is 9,000 caterpillars. So one clutch of chickadees, let's say four, four little chicks, it requires 9,000 caterpillars to raise that, that clutch from the time they're an egg to the time that they, they are out and you see them in your backyards. And these are not big birds. If, if you've seen a chickadee, they're pretty small little birds. Native plants host those caterpillars, those insects, and those insects are then bird food. So without native plants, we just don't see any birds. Um, and so I always like to recommend if you're just diving into kind of this intersection of birds and gardening and habitat creation, Doug Tallamy has a book that everybody really loves to, to tout and it's called Bringing Nature Home. And he actually did a study that he writes about in this book where he looked at how many species of Lepidoptera. And so Lepidoptera are our moths and our butterflies. So how many species of moths and butterflies did all of these various um, tree species host? Um, and this isn't individuals, this is numbers of species. And he found, you can see at the bottom, we've got a lot of our classic Houston ornamental trees. Crepe myrtles are like the most common tree you see in Houston. Um, and they only host three species of Lepidoptera. Bamboo hosts one. Nandina, which is like the worst plant, hosts zero and also has kind of poisonous berries. Um, so golden rain tree only hosts one. Look up at the top and you've got all of our native trees. So our oaks, our maples, willows, you're seeing 500 plus Lepidoptera species. So over 500 different species of moths and butterflies can be hosted by an oak tree. Um, and so keep that in mind as we're like diving into why native plants are important and when Chris talks about his journey with his own yard a little bit later. All right, and so it's not just trees. Uh, again, Houston was a primarily prairie and with some riparian, so some trees along the, the bayous. Um, so, but, and it's not just, a lot of people think of prairies as grasses, just grasses, but prairies are a lot more and they are so amazingly diverse. And so these are just a couple of my personal favorite flowers from uh, that are native to our Houston region. Um, Kansas blazing star, and there's several species of blazing star, lance leaf blanket flower and its cousin, uh, in Indian blanket or, or fire wheel. Um, we've got rough comb flower, Texas comb flower. Um, all of these different species of flower help host our native insects. And so do our grasses. Um, and the grasses don't have to be kind of this standard turf grass. In fact, we don't like our turf grass very much. It's non-native and it does not host very much, um, very much in the way of insects. But we've got things like Gulf Muley, yellow Indian grass, little blue stem, all of which can be incredibly beautiful when used um, in your own yard. And, and milkweeds, of course, are another thing that's really important for supporting those Lepidoptera species. Our monarch butterflies could would not be here without our milkweed species. And there's like a 10 different milkweed species that you can commonly find in the, in the greater Houston area and that you can plant at home. Um, and then it's not just insects. Some of our uh, frugivorous birds like to eat on the berries and the, the berries are timed perfectly well for when these birds are flying through and need them. So we got a Baltimore Oriole here on a, on a cherry and we got um, one of our warblers on an American beauty berry, which is a, another amazing understory native. Um, but not all plants, of course, are made <laughs> are made the same. So Houston and anywhere there's a large urban center, um, a lot of people moving in from other places, we like to bring plants that are near and dear to our heart with us, even if they don't belong. And sometimes those plants don't thrive well, and sometimes they thrive too well, and they will outcompete our native species. So the big ones that um, Houston Audubon tar like has to fight basically on our on our properties. And other people will see in parks and in areas all around our region are Chinese privet, 
Japanese climbing firm and Chinese tallow. And I'm sure everyone here has seen many Chinese tallows walking around Houston. It, I mean, yards have them, parks have them. Um, and even though we're spending time and energy and our partners are spending time and energy removing these plants to try and let our native plants grow, we unfortunately run into things like, this is the Houston Garden Center, uh, garden centers suggesting these plants as a fast growing shrub with variegated foliage that you too can grow at home. So when you're diving into this native planting journey, it's really important to like do some research before you head to the garden center or, or to your local, local um, nursery. And so that's where Houston Audubon has filled a, a small amount of that gap. We have a native plant nursery at our Edith Elmore Nature Sanctuary where we sell plants, not only to partners um, across the region, but also to homeowners and people who are interested in, in planting um, native plants at home. And Houston Audubon's whole mission is to, to grow what we call real deal native plants. And so these are native plants that have been grown from locally collected seed sources. There are no cultivars. They are as uh, they're basically like they came straight from the prairie and they can help go to your yard to start to help support those native insects and our native birds. Um, we're not the only ones. There, there are several places you can get native plants, real deal native plants around the area. Um, if you've got wetland, need, wetland needs, wetland, uh, Green Star Wetland Plants is a great place to go. The Native Plant Society has a number of different plant sales. The Houston Arboretum does plant sales. And there's also local nurseries who will carry some native plants as well. But remember when you go to always bring your list of plants and to do some research because not all nurseries carry all natives. Um, but I'm gonna leave the rest of the bird-friendly gardening stuff to Chris a little bit later on. He's gonna talk about what, how he applied um, some of these principles and the amazing success he's had. So I'm gonna go into the three other steps of bird-friendly communities. The next one is creating inviting habitat. And so there's a couple components uh, for creating inviting habitat. It continues to build on this using native plants, restoring habitat. Um, we need, like to think about layers of vegetation. So uh, the more, if you think, the more various types of plants you could have in a yard or in a habitat, the more various types of birds and insects you could theoretically host. Um, so the worst case scenario is a monoculture of sod, of non-native sod, and anything you can add to your backyard. I mean, we all basically start with a monoculture of sod in um, our, our urban backyards, but the more you can rip up sod and add other layers of native plants, the better. So structural diversity is key when you're thinking about some of this. Um, but there's other things you can do to create inviting habitat. Um, restoring areas for birds to nest in. So a lot of times trees where birds would normally nest are pretty dangerous to have around your house um, for fear of them falling over in a storm or things like that. So a lot of folks don't like to have snags in their backyard. If you have a big enough backyard where you can leave the snags, that's always pre preferable. Um, but there are opportunities to help support our nesting birds, our resident birds, like the Eastern Screech Owl here, um, through building nest boxes. Um, and this, this website, nestwatch.org, will actually tell you what birds you should put up nest boxes for and what height to install them at and give you all the dimensions. It's a great website if you're interested in being a, um, a bird landlord. Um, and then around town, you might see these when you're out walking, walking the trails, but we also um, work with partners to install chimney swift nest boxes. So these are crazy tall looking structures and they actually only host one chimney swift um, nest per tower. So the more of these we can have around the better, but um, that's what those are if you see them around. Great for larger community projects. And then water. Uh, we think you know about Houston and it's got so much water around, but fresh water is sometimes hard for our birds to find. Um, and so by installing water features, fresh water sources, you not only are providing water for our resident migratory birds, but it also, if you've got a little bit of water movement, they will be attracted to your yard more. And so you will have the opportunity to enjoy and connect with those birds even more via um, water. And finally, feeding birds. This one is um, an excellent supplement to all of the other things. I, I wouldn't, you know, it's best to not only just feed birds. You always want to have other opportunities for the birds around, but um, Feeding birds is a great supplement, especially during the winter or when Houston has weird weather events where maybe other natural food sources aren't as prevalent. And especially in our urban environments where we've removed a lot of those natural 
food sources, having bird feeders around can really help um, support some of our, our birds traveling through. Um, note on this, more and more in the past couple of years, we, the, there have been issues with sick birds passing diseases onto one another via bird feeders. So if you are going to hang up bird feeders, you, you are taking on the responsibility to keep up with those bird feeders, to maintain them, to clean them, and to be on the lookout for sick birds. And if you do see sick birds, to remove those bird feeders for a couple of weeks, make sure they're bleached and, um, and try and take care of the birds who could potentially be uh, having negative impacts to our interactions with them. All right, number three. This is uh, a lot of people know that this is my favorite topic. I um, love to get into the threats that um, birds face in our urban environment and how we all together can help reduce those threats. So there's five main threats that um, Houston Audubon works with. Um, cats, pesticides, plastics, daytime collisions, and nighttime collisions. So I'm going to go briefly into this. These are the basics. If you have uh, questions about any of these and more specifics, I, can, I will be giving you more resources um, to dive into after this presentation. All right, I've got another quiz for you. You didn't think you would have to have quizzes tonight, but here we are. Um, how many birds do free roaming cats kill in the United States each year? And there have been studies and all the studies kind of come to, this, to a similar range. That's why there's ranges on this slide. So, Put your best guess into the chat. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Um, and this is just in the US. So we'll see what, what we're representing with. All right, I see some chats coming in. You're probably, some of you are right. It is two to 4 billion birds each year in the US alone. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service did a study. The Smithsonian did a study. Uh, it's always in that kind of same range. That is a huge, one of the worst impacts on birds. Um, we talk a lot about building collisions and everything, but there are there's no single other bigger killer of our um, birds other than habitat loss than um, outdoor cats. So what can you do? Cats, keeping cats indoors really is key. Um, outdoor cats, it's not only good for the birds, it's good for the cats. So outdoor cats suffer a much higher incidence of injury, parasites, disease, um, than, than indoor cats, but the, and a lot of people will have cats who are energetic and enjoy the outdoors, but there are options for keeping those cats contained and not on the, on the loose. Um, catios have become a really cool trend. I, you see more and more of them. I have a neighbor with a really nice catio and those cats have a great time observing the birds without the potential for injuring them. Um, I also have a friend who has leash trained her cat and takes him on hikes, and I mean, he would think he's a dog. He has such a good time. Um, and there's, of course, always indoor enrichment as well, but uh, keeping cats indoors is key. And um, the American Bird Conservancy has a cats indoors website that really has a lot more information on this and more tips and tricks for how to successfully keep a happy cat indoors. Pesticides is another one, and this goes hand in hand with our native plant suggestions. So the whole point of restoring habitat, not the whole point, I mean, there's a lot of points, but one of the main points is to help support our native insect populations, which are struggling as it is. Um, and so when we go ahead and spray our areas with pesticides, we see uh, not only a decrease in insects, but a decrease in birds overall as well. So one study found that there was a 30% decline over 10 years of birds where the pesticide um, application was, was regularly done. Um, and the higher the pesticide concentration used, the more severely those bird populations dropped for the whole area. Um, pesticides and insecticides not only um, have this impact of killing insects, which drives birds away, but they can often kill birds directly. Um, we've also seen things like rodenticides being really problematic for our raptors. And so anytime you can avoid putting, uh, poison out into the world, it's probably best. Um, I'll say I lived in Laporte for a while and they would come and spray the mosquitoes regularly. And I always noticed before the mosquito spraying trucks came around for the season, we would have hundreds and hundreds, thousands even of dragonflies and the mosquito populations wouldn't be too bad. But as soon as they sprayed, it seemed like the dragonflies were suddenly gone and the mosquitoes were back. So I don't know that the mosquito spray, this is anecdotal, uh, don't quote me on it, but I don't know that the mosquito spray was having the effect they wanted it to. Um, 
Plastic pollution is a big one for the big city of Houston. We are downstream of Dallas too. So we're all in the same river shed um, and all of our uh, garbage ends up somewhere. And so a lot of that garbage doesn't make it quite make it to the landfill. Um, so birds are some of the species that are most heavily impacted by our plastic use. Uh, almost every species of seabird on earth, of which there's thousands, at least a thousand, um, have been observed ingesting plastic. Um, and some of them die from the plastic and some of them are, are impacted other ways. Um, it's not only ingestion that's the issue, it's entanglement, um, it's having injury from the plastic that then leads to infection. So the message here is first, try and cut your plastic, your single use plastic consumption. Um, and then of course, reduce, reuse, recycle. This, um, these photos were taken when we were out doing a bird survey in Galveston Bay and this pelican chick had an entire bo plastic bottle lodged in its, um, in its little pouch. And if we hadn't gone and intervened, that little pelican chick would not have made it. And so you can only imagine how many birds just in our bay alone are, are kind of facing the same scary problem. Collision prevention. So bird collisions can be really broken down into two main categories daytime collisions and nighttime collisions. And even though they, these two issues kind of result in the same final issue for a bird, they really have two different mechanisms and two different um, ways to kind of prevent the collisions from happening. So daytime collisions, about a billion birds a year hit um, windows in the US every year. Um, that's both daytime and nighttime collisions. And about 50% of those hit home windows. So our homes, our houses, um, not these tall skyscrapers. Um, and typically those home window hits are um, daytime collisions because windows, birds just fully cannot understand the concept of a window. And not only do windows not, are birds unable to kind of see windows, they, windows tend to reflect things like foliage or the sky. Um, and then birds see it as a welcoming entrance instead of a uh, a solid piece of glass that um, ends in their demise. So um, there are things to do to prevent daytime collisions. If you have a big picture window that's problematic, there are pretty simple and cheap ways you can fix it. Um, there's decals, you can hang up line. Um, there's a number of different like additions you can do to your window if it's already a problem. In Houston, I, I think, um, most of us have screens on a lot of our windows. So thankfully a screen itself is a deterrent and birds often won't injure themselves if they're bumping into a screen. Um, Bird-friendly architecture, if you're thinking about building a new home or involved in, in, with somebody who is building a new home, uh, really thinking about how your house could impact birds ahead of time will make things a lot cheaper and, and probably more, uh, aesthetically pleasing to both the people and the birds. Um, if we kind of start to take a step back and think about how our new home, it, glass is often very beautiful and it's very nice to have big, huge windows, but thinking about ways we can um, adjust that architectural uh, appearance to better support our neighbors, our bird neighbors. Um, also I'll note if you are feeding birds, you would like, to, it's best to either place feeders three feet or closer to a window or more than 30 feet away from a window. So if a bird's around a feeder and a predator comes in, they'll often quickly kind of run away from the predator. And if they're within 30 feet of a window, oftentimes that'll be why they hit a window um, in their attempt to escape a predator. The other thing, and, and a big program at Houston Audubon is preventing nighttime collisions. Again, it's a totally different mechanism causing the same problem. Um, so most of our North American birds are migratory. I think it's about 80% of our North American birds are migratory. And the vast majority of those migratory birds migrate at night. Um, and so again, about 2 billion birds migrate through the state of Texas every year um, on their Northern and Southern routes. Um, and, and unfortunately light, we don't fully know the mechanism, but it's hypothesize that um, birds are attracted to light because they rely on the stars and the moonlight to navigate. And so when we have big bright cities, they are attracted to this light and then quickly disoriented by this light. And when they are disoriented, they can, in these big cities with big buildings, they it also often results in um, collisions with these big buildings. Um, 
And so our program started in 2017 when um, Galveston, a building in Galveston had a mass collision event where over 400 birds collided with one building in one night. And it was because that building was very well lit. Um, and so we started using Cornell Lab of Ornithology's BirdCast program, which is a bird migration prediction uh, program that uses uh, radar technology um, to inform when these buildings should start turning out their lights. And we were really excited because in 2020, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology reached out to us and said, hey, we wanna take your program and we would like to make it a statewide program. So our Lights Out for Bird programs became Lights Out Texas. We got a slew of amazing partners who, got, who came in and joined us. And we've had a ton more success because of these partners and because of the support of Houston, the city of Houston, the city of Dallas and cities across the state. So not only have we able to like, been able to expand this program to cover the entire state, but we also have been able to uh, leverage that for encouraging more buildings to participate encouraging cities to encourage more buildings to participate. And we've also been able to automate our action alerts. So if you would like to receive action alerts anytime migration is high, migration's high tonight, by the way, um, you can sign up here if you are in a city that is a bird city, Texas. So right now it's still in its early stages. So it's just for several Texas cities, but Houston and Dallas are both um, those cities. So. We're also doing collision monitoring to understand exactly what buildings, what features of buildings impact why birds hit them, to understand um, what time as, times of the, of the migration season, to understand what weather patterns are all impacting why birds hit these buildings, and to better inform our suggestions to these buildings for um, getting their lights out. And you too can help at home. It's not just the tall buildings lit up that is the problem. It's overall sky glow. So the more lights we can get out at night during migration periods, the better. And so we're right in smack dab in the middle of fall migration right now. Um, so peak fall migration is a longer period. It's September 5th to October 29th. And so if you can encourage not only yourself, but your neighbors, maybe your office building or your apartment building to turn out all exterior non-essential lighting, between 11 and six, you can help um, birds migrate safely through our region. All right, we're getting through this. Um, the final thing is get connected with others and gold stars for everyone here. You are here, you're connecting, you're learning. And so getting connected with others is probably one of the more fun uh, parts of BFC, of bird friendly communities. Um, how, to, how can you start to get more connected? Just get outside and enjoy birds. If you're outside connecting with and enjoying birds, you're more likely to talk to your friends about how cool birds are and encourage them to kind of follow through on some of these bird friendly actions. Um, feel free to log your sightings on eBird. It gets addicting and all of that data then goes to help inform how populations are doing across not only our region, but across the entire world. Um, I also encourage everybody to join a bird survey. We have 14 monthly urban bird surveys. There's bird week, which is happening right now. So we have a couple more bird surveys this bird week. And there's things like Christmas bird count and other specialty timing bird surveys that you can join. It's not only fun to get out and see birds, but it's really good time to meet other people who are interested in birds and conservation and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you'd like to become a member of Houston Audubon, again, 15% off at, through tomorrow. Um, you, we have events and, and uh, speaker events and things like that where it's a great way to get more connected with other folks interested in this. And then talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your coworkers um, that you would find, you'll be amazed at how many people can connect to birds through one of these actions. So, I mean, I've been approached by people just when I'm using binoculars asking what I'm seeing or if they talk about coffee, we can talk about bird friendly coffee. So there's all kinds of different ways you can connect with others about bird friendly actions. And then finally, this one I love, talk to your plant nurseries. Even if you're at a plant nursery that you found out doesn't have a single native plant, ask them if they carry native plants, ask them if they would consider carrying native plants and really start to engage them. Because the more they hear there's a demand for native to Harris County plants, the more they're gonna seek out those plants and provide them so other people can also um, start to plant native. And so I'll just quickly go through this. We have, again, 14 monthly urban bird surveys. Chances are there's a monthly urban bird survey near you. Chris leads one of our monthly urban bird surveys down in Hitchcock at the UH Coastal Center. 
Um, we have another new one at the Mercer Botanic Gardens up near the woodlands. So they um, are great, a great chance to, to bird, to, to get a little bit better at your birding skills if that's what you're looking for, or to just kind of go on a nice walk and meet some really fun people. Um, I'll also direct everybody to our Bird Friendly Communities website. It is birdfriendlyhouston.org and I'll put it in the chat, but um, we've got all of this information plus more there. We've got more, more details on how you can help birds at home, on things like bird friendly, like window decals and, and window treatments, stuff like that. So if you have questions, the chances are they're, they're answered on this website. And we've got a bunch of different blog posts as well, all about how you can get started or dive deeper into being bird friendly in your own space. Um, on the website, we also have a bird friendly habitat guide, which is great if you are representing, representing a larger community or a project, and that guide is available for download to share with whoever you think might be interested. And then finally, we are launching our bird, relaunching our bird friendly yard program starting January, 2022. It will be the bird friendly spaces program. It'll be an opportunity for you to register your own space, whether it's a space with no outdoor availability all the way up to a whole community. There will be an opportunity for you to get recognition and um, help and see how you can improve your efforts for um, having a bird friendly space. So. If you're interested in that, it will live on the Bird Friendly Communities website and be look on the lookout, follow Houston Audubon for updates. Um, that'll be coming very soon. And so finally, I just kind of like to show this picture to wrap things up. And Chris is gonna show, I think, just as amazing photos. But this is a example of a yard that um, implements all of the bird friendly actions. So this is a local Houstonian and she has done all the, all the different actions. You can see her native plants in there. It's, she's got a very well-designed yard. It's still aesthetically quite, quite a garden. Um, so she not only has that, but she has feeders, nest boxes, a water feature. She did never uses pesticides and she has a couple pet cats and they live inside. And she's kind of doing everything that you should do right. And I'm really excited for you to see Chris's presentation too, because he's done the exact same thing just a lot more recently. And, I, and again, so all of your small actions, all of these add up to really big impact across our region. The more people we have making just the smallest little, even if you just hang up a bird feeder, you are helping having a big, an, a big impact for our birds. And so Bird Week continues. We've got uh, two events on Friday. Um, a movie night at Levy Park is happening tomorrow night. You should go out. I think um, the, it's a Rio, which is a really fun conservation themed movie. It's family friendly. And we got all this stuff going on on Saturday. So I'm not gonna leave it up too long, houstonaudubon.org slash birdweek. Um, and finally, if you're interested in getting more involved with Houston Audubon, we have volunteering opportunities, we have classes coming up, and we have our um, avian affair coming up as well. So thank you. I appreciate you all listening to me and I'm super excited to hand it over to Chris and then we will take questions and um, excitedly have conversations with all of you. All right, thanks, Anna. Uh, I just want to start off with an introduction uh, about me. I've been birding for about three years, um, and I got into birding through gardening. Um, and I was actually challenged, or not challenged, but motivated by a, another local Houstonian bird watcher uh, who uh, birds in their backyard. Um, and I was just impressed by the amount of rare birds that they would get. Um, so I started, you know, piece by piece, starting to develop my yard to, to try to do the, the same thing. Um, and it's really transformed into a challenge of trying to attract these uh, rare birds and other birds into now uh, more of a, a uh, goal or focus to uh, educate others um, because I'm seeing the impacts that it's having in just the, the short amount of time of three years of doing this. So I'm thinking big picture now and if I can motivate or inspire other people to do the same, uh, the impacts that we can have to restore uh, the natural word, world around us uh, will be incredible. So I'm going to go ahead and start off, try to get this going. Does everybody can see my screen? You see it? Yeah, it's your bird cast. Yeah. All right. So this, and just to give you a, oh, this is not working now. That's not fun. I was trying to give you an overview of my uh, backyard, a satellite photo. It just worked. 
All right, so this is my backyard right here. This is my neighborhood. I'm right at the end of this tree line here. So you can see here, this is before um, the winter. So I'm not sure when Google took this picture over my house, but here's my backyard. I have a shed here and this was just a garden. So this was the basic beginning of my journey into um, backyard habitat. Now I would say two thirds of this backyard is now um, native plants or other um, plants that the birds can, can utilize. All right, so this is this is my slideshow of bird friendly habitat. This is my journey and my experiences on on um, how I've gotten to this this particular part that I'm at right now. This right here is an Anna's hummingbird, uh, which is a western hummingbird. It's a rarity in the Houston area. They normally show up in late winter. Um, this is a male, um, and this right here is a scarlet sage plant that I had planted in the winter. So it does bloom in the winter, you know, since we have the mild winters. And what is fascinating about this bird is even though I had, you know, five um, sugar water feeders, hummingbird feeders up, he refused to go to any of those and would rather go to the natural food sources. So um, I'm glad that that was up there for him. So this is how the backyard looked um, last winter. Uh, this is prior to the big freeze that we just had. Um, you can see here that I had torn out the grass and um, replaced it with um, soil. Um, I have a water feature here. Uh, it's just a regular water fountain. And this is my massive feeding towers. I actually take these down um, when spring happens because the natural food sources come back and uh, the food is more plentiful. Um, but during the winter, um, it's amazing how you can see birds that primarily uh, feed on insects. They come to uh, these feeders to feed on the seeds because they just cannot find the, the, the available food sources. So I put these up, these monstrosities, these massive uh, feeders up during the winter only, um, and it, it, it works out for the best. Um, so that was the right side. So this is the left side of my um, yard um, in the winter where I, I took, again, took out the grass. You can see all the dead grass here, took this grass out as well, and pl uh, placed soil. Now in all of these soil areas, I, had, I spread wildflower seeds that are native to our area in these er um, this soil area. And these are the pictures of how they look afterwards. Um, these are all native plants in here, all native um, flowers, basically. And the birds love this. It doesn't look like a home and garden magazine picturesque. Um, I probably could make it that way, but I've just seen the impact of just letting it grow naturally. And the, the birds just are all in there, not just the birds, but the butterflies and the bees. Um, I've had over, I would say about seven or eight different species of butterflies that I've documented um, in this uh, garden that I had not seen. I've lived in this uh, house for about 10 years. I'd never seen them before until um, starting to plant these um, plants. Now, this is the right side. These tall ones right here are Maximilian sunflowers. Um, what's awesome about these is that the, uh, the bees and the butterflies actually utilize these a lot during the uh, spring and summer. But right now during the fall, all of them have gone to seed. So all of them have these huge seed, seed heads or a lot of little seed heads on them. And guess who uses them now, now that they're migrating through the area, the birds. So it's awesome to see all these little birds that will come into it and start um, eating up the natural food sources. Even though I have this here, they'll always go to these natural areas, which is pretty amazing to see. So this right, this might be hard to see, but this is a water feature that I um, created um, in my backyard. It's adjacent to two different uh, plants. So it provides like an overhead shade and cover um, you can see it, it's real small here. It's maybe only about two or three inches deep. And the rain or the uh, water goes through this um, little tube and it creates like a small little uh, river effect. And that trickling water is actually what brings the birds in. They'll see the reflection from the sun onto the water. And then they'll also hear the uh, trickling. Um, this is a little waterfall here. And this area right here is about two feet deep. And this, help, this helps to create that reservoir. So I don't have to fill it up every time. Um, and I have another uh, small pump underneath all those rocks to keep the water circulating and it keeps the mosquitoes down. So that's very helpful. And uh, I have a video coming up that you'll see the, uh, the effects of um, how this is, how it works. All right, here it is. Um, this might be a little loud because the, the, the uh, camera is close to um, the spout where the water comes out. Uh, so I'll just give you a warning. You'll just hear the trickling water. Um, so this is last year, this is last fall um, where this video was taken. And actually, I think it was maybe at the towards the end of November, uh, October. So that shows you how long 
um, the fall migration goes. We're coming up, like we just, I would say we just started, um, honestly, because we just had that first major cold front come through. Um, but this was uh, towards the end of October. Right here, you can see uh, one Nashville warbler right there. Um, but I'll show you the impact it has. Um, here we go. So all of these are migrating birds. These are these are birds that are not in our area um, during the summertime. So there's a black-throated green warbler that just showed up here. These are these are about three or four different species of, of migrating birds that are coming through. I think it's so funny when they, they peep the camera. They're like checking it out. Is this safe? So just to see this, if you actually went out actively bird watching, you'd be hard pressed to see this many migrating birds in just one particular area. So that alone just shows you the impact of creating something like this. This is three different species. And I would say there was about at least 10 different ones all hopping around the area when I when this video was taken. So that's just, I mean, to me, that was just amazing when I saw that um, because I, I had never seen that before, that many migrating birds in, in one particular area. And this is just in my backyard. Now imagine if all of us did something similar to this um, just to help them out and, and um, during their travel. Um, so this particular water feature, all this is, is a uh, tarp that I bought at Home Depot. You can probably find them anywhere. Um, and I just laid it out. Um, I dug, dug uh, the dimensions that I, I wanted to, to do, I laid out the tarp and um, basically just built around it, uh, made it to where the water would trickle down into that reservoir. Um, all total, I would say this cost me maybe $80, all total with the rocks and the, the pump. Um, the labor into it, it took me maybe, I would say about three hours to, to get it right. Um, but you can see the impact right there, um, just creating something like that. All right, now on to my, this is my favorite. My favorite is hummingbirds. Um, so this right here is a, uh, this right here is a, uh, I think it's a black chin hummingbird, a uh, immature male. Um, these, these come through our area, I think during the spring they do migrate, um, small, small numbers, but in the wintertime is there your best opportunity to get uh, rare hummingbirds. So this was in the wintertime. This goes on to, this was my, my rarest hummingbird that I've had in my backyard. This is an Allen's hummingbird. Um, this hummingbird is primarily off the west, west coast um, is where they, they normally uh, breed. Um, and they're, they're not really known to be in our area too often. Uh, but every once in a while we'll have one pop up. So this one I saw, uh, I think it was the winter of 2019. And you can see that he's an immature uh, male because uh, he doesn't have the gorget in, in uh, or like the colors in his throat. Um, so this one, we, we uh, ended up banding um, last winter in my backyard. We banded, I think around 10 um, hummingbirds, about four different species of hummingbirds. Um, so what's interesting is when we banded him, he was an adult male then, and we banded him, and he came back to my uh, my backyard this year in August. So he's he came back in August. So he, for three years, this one hummingbird that has traveled thousands of miles has gone to the breeding area and traveled all the way back to Houston to my yard just to to uh, winter in the area. So that's just amazing that it felt that comfortable and the the environment was so uh, conducive to him his survival that he decided, hey. I got to come back there and so I can make it another winter. So that just shows you uh, another example of um, how your yard can make an impact. Again, this is the another, uh, the male uh, Anna's hummingbird. 
um, feeding on natural uh, food sources again. This is a broad-tailed hummingbird, another Western hummingbird. It's an immature male. Um, I believe he came around uh, the end of December or January uh, was when he, when he showed up to the yard. Now, this was interesting. This is a uh, immature male ruby hummingbird, and it's a, attacking or uh, trying to chase off a calliope, which is a, our smallest North American hummingbird. Um, so this calliope is also another Western hummingbird, another uncommon or rare hummingbird in our area that uh, showed up um, last winter. And I'm going to let you guys on a little secret since you guys attended. So you'll notice these uh, red flowers, these fake red flowers in the background. These are uh, just, I mean, I guess just regular like um, luau flowers, I guess you would say, um, that I got from Amazon. And I, this is an experiment. I, I just didn't even know this would work. But I, I put them on the shepherd's hook where I put the uh, the hummingbird feeders and, and what I was intending to do was attract them um, to the feeders because hummingbirds um, go to the color of red um, a lot. Um, so I put those flowers up and it, it ended up working. I ended up uh, getting eight hummingbird species um, alone last winter. And also what's interesting is I can tell which hummingbird has been to my yard or it, it has hung out for a couple of days just by knowing that when they show up, if they go to the red uh, fake flowers, I know that they're new because the older ones that have been there, they don't go to those, they go straight to the feeder. So that's another interesting uh, thing right there. Here's another picture of the uh, immature male calliope hummingbird. Another picture of the broad tailed. Now this one was pretty cool. This one um, I had um, last winter as well. This is a buff bellied hummingbird. Um, they do have small numbers. Um, in South Texas, like the immediate border area um, would be one of them. And uh, small numbers do migrate during the winter time up north um, towards the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, I, I think has a few records of them. So this one was cool. It's a, it's a pretty large hummingbird. Um, it, you'd be able to pick it out um, easily in your yard if it visits, but it was interesting to see. It's very loud. You'll, you'll hear it before you see it a lot of times, but it was, it was cool to have that one. This is a Rufus hummingbird, similar to the Allen's hummingbird, but you can notice here in the back, um, there's no green. Um, this bird was also banded last year, and he also returned. So that's two species of hummingbirds that have come back to the yard um, that have been documented. Um, so you can't really see his band on this picture, but we, we were able to get photos um, a few weeks ago to verify that that's him. And you can see where he's perched at right here. These are the seed heads of a Maximilian sunflower seed. So the other birds will start eating those as they, they migrate through. All right, now back onto the, the feeding. Um, so I made this little platform. You'll see a couple pictures of other ones. Um, but I, I prefer using the platform feeders. Um, it just gives the uh, bigger birds a chance to, to get the food as well. Um, it's just easier for viewing. Um, but this right here is a yellow rump warbler. Um, normally not a seed eater. Uh, more insects, but you can tell that during the winter time, the insects aren't around as much. And now he's snacking on a, a peanut that I had put out there for him. This is a pine warbler. And also this is another insect uh, um, eating bird and normally primarily goes to pine trees. Um, you'll see them in pine trees, hence the name. Um, but again, in the winter time, I'll have maybe 10 or 15 of these guys coming into the feeder. So that's, that's one of the times where you really want to supplement their food. This is a hermit thrush that came in the wintertime. This is a, just your regular run-of-the-mill uh, water container or bird bath. Um, he would come into this bird bath. Um, never really went to the actual water feature, but he definitely hung around there because there was you know concealment and cover there. But this was a cool bird to see. Um, normally you see these in more dense areas. But I guess the dense area that I had I had made for my uh, garden was good enough for him, so he would come every once in a while and check it out. Is a um, was a black throated green warbler. This one was cool. Um, this is a dark eyed junco. Um, and what, what's interesting is when you start to attract these birds and you, and they're making a ruckus or or uh, something like that. It, what's cool to see is that these other birds that are close by. Like, hey, I got to check that out. Let's see what's going on. So he, he ended up doing that. He followed in a few bluebirds that knew that there was feeders around. So he followed them in and, and then found the food source. And I don't think, I think I only saw him that day. So that just shows you how uncommon it is, um, at least in my area. But that was, a, that was a fun bird to see last year. 
Now this one was pretty cool. This is a black throated uh, gray warbler and uh, it came to the water feature only. Um, and this is a Western bird that was pretty rare. And I had a few people come to the yard to, to try to catch a glimpse of him. Uh, he was here for about three days, um, probably got uh, disoriented and lost, um, but he was here for three days and would come to the water feature. Again, highlighting the importance of having um, you know, different kinds of water features out, uh, be it a just regular bird bath or um, a river pond kind of uh, creation that you can come up with. So red-breasted nuthatch, um, he would come to the feeders and the, uh, the bird bath area. I just had one two days ago, which is, uh, which is flagged as rare because it's a little early for them to be in our area, uh, but they do show up during the winter time. This is another wintering bird that uh, comes down. All right, so this right here is the video of that um, black-throated gray warbler to give you a little view of them. So right there next to him is a yellow rump warbler. So this is the black-throated gray coming up to the camera. So not only is it cool to have something like this that you can make, it doesn't have to be this big or this elaborate. Um, just a small uh, pond with the trickling water, you, you'd be surprised what you can find um, to show up. And even if they don't show up, you know, every day, at least you have something cool that's in your backyard and makes that sound. It's really calming and relaxing. This is a clay colored sparrow, another uh, uncommon or rare bird in the Houston area. Um, this one in particular, um, during the winter time when the grass is low and doesn't grow as much, um, since the grass is uh, at a small level, I'll throw out what's called a white millet seed. And it's, it's real cheap. It's only maybe about two or three bucks a bag. And they love that. They, uh, they feed on that kind of stuff all the time. This year, I actually grew it naturally. Uh, so I didn't have to get any, um, from the store. So hopefully by the time they, they start showing up, which should be in a few weeks, um, the crop will be ready for them to, to feed off of. But this one was cool because he would come in with the chipping sparrows and they look very similar. Um, so I was able to get photos to be able to distinguish them. Um, but just having that small area, that small patch where I could put out that millet seed and they felt comfortable getting into it was pretty cool um, that they would come in and, and do that um, every once in a while. It's a um, yellow-throated warbler, cool, cool warbler. Um, there's a few that, that come down during the winter time. They'll, they'll spend some time here. Again, um, he didn't go into the, the feeders. He went to the water features. Um, so most of these birds that, that, that come in and are the rarities, they're not looking for the food. It's just the water that's available. Like Anna um, highlighted earlier, uh, it's important to have fresh water because we can go you know, weeks and, and maybe a month or so in the winter time without water and providing that for them will bring them in. They'll find it. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome to see. Pine siskins, these, these were huge um, last winter. These guys showed up in force pretty much all through our area. Um, I remember watching the reports of them being labeled as rare on eBird. And as soon as they started showing up in numbers, um, yeah, those alerts stopped because we knew that we were in a, what's called an eruption um, year. And it shows a, uh, and it shows <clears throat> when they start uh, losing feed source, uh, food sources up north, they'll continue to move further south to find um, that food that's available. So last year we had an eruption year uh, for pine siskins. And uh, man, it was crazy. I would have, uh, I would say maybe 70 or so in the, in the area. And they're loud. They're super loud. Um, it was annoying at the time hearing them always call out. But now I miss it, man, because they're they are pretty awesome birds um, to see, and I hope we get a chance to see them again in the uh, winter. This is another um, bird that's uh, was part of the eruption year. It's a purple finch. Um, it's you know rare to, or uncommon in our area during the winter time. More more closer to the northern counties, I would say, in Harris County or northern areas of Harris County, you would see them. Um, but I was uh, lucky to see this this one male come in, um, and he would eat the sunflower seeds. So again providing them with food that when during the winter time is um, not available, you know, brings them and tracks them in. 
another picture of my hermit thrush, hermit thrush friend. This is a, another rarity that I had, a Western tanager. Um, again, he, he went to the water feature, so water is awesome. Um, it, I, I would say it would be the number one uh, thing on my list to attract uh, uh, birds or rare birds, if, you, if that's what you're looking to do. <clears throat> this is a male bluebird um, on top of a nesting box. I've had about three generations of bluebirds um, in my backyard. I've had, uh, I, I would say two to three uh, clutches a year or broods a year. Uh, but when uh, one thing to highlight is, uh, I guess this goes hand in hand with, uh, um, I guess, eliminating threats. Uh, when you do put these nesting boxes up, you wanna make sure that you put up a predator guard um, or limit the abil ability for things to try to climb up the pole and, and get into the uh, nest box. Um, this year, I learned a lesson of um, making sure I watch what I plant around them. Those Maximilian sunflower plants got up to about eight to 10 feet tall. They would get thick. Um, and I'd never thought about it, but um, one day I was out in the backyard in the morning and I heard the uh, mama bluebird calling out with the alert call. And I was like, oh, I wonder what's going on. So I went to go check that area around the nest box to see what was going on. And a snake had climbed up one of those Maximilian sunflowers. It was trying to get in um, to the nest box and I, I was lucky to catch it in time. So I cut around that area and, and uh, limited that ability for that snake to try to get in there. This is a great crested flycatcher. This is during spring uh, when he migrated through. And that's it. Um, so I would say, I would say the, the, the biggest thing to do is when you see your yard, um, just picture Try to picture what you, you intend to do. Um, make a plan. Make sure you do your research. Uh, reach out uh, to Houston Audubon and especially the Bird Friendly uh, Committee because we, we, we're, we're passionate about this. Um, we want to continue to share this journey with other people. And um, we, I always have people either calling me or emailing me, people that I have never met before, but uh, know that I'm passionate about this. And I love talking to them um, just, just to try to Give them an idea of what they can do and and to help them out now, and when you do start try not to do it all at once um that's the biggest the biggest part um it's been three years that i've done this and i've done a section at a time um to to try to improve my my garden so make sure you don't burn yourself out uh, by trying to transform your entire um, garden because it, it, it it'll be tough to do does anybody have any questions Thanks so much, Chris. That was, I mean, I'm always amazed at your yard. Okay. <laughs> one, one question. Do you have to, okay. So the, the water feature, um, that, that pond that I made, it just recycles the water. So there's, there's not water, uh, going into it all the time. It's a pump that, that is at the bottom of that reservoir that feeds into a tube at the top. So that's what you saw there. That running water is actually just recycled water from, from the, uh, Awesome, and everybody, you're welcome to either um, put your questions in the chat or turn on your camera and unmute yourself, whatever you wanna do. I'm gonna stop recording now. Thanks again, Chris, um, and we can,